Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Kate McIntosh. I'm the Executive Director of the Promise Institute for Human Rights here at UCLA School of Law and I'm delighted to welcome you to our event discussing what's happening in Tigray as part of our Human Rights Around the World series. Our co-sponsors today uh, include the International and Comparative Law Programme at UCLA and the UCLA African Studies Centre. And on behalf of all of us here at UCLA, I would like to acknowledge our presence on the traditional, ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. So the situation in Tigray is devastating. As fighting in the region continues, there are multiple reports of people, especially children, dying of starvation. On October the 1st, after the UN humanitarian chief, Martin Griffiths, condemned a de facto government blockade of humanitarian aid, seven top UN officials were expelled from the country. Meanwhile, High Commissioner Michelle Bachelet reported on evidence gathered by her office of attacks on civilians, torture, sexual and gender-based violence, and enforced disappearances to the Human Rights Council late last month. With us today to help us understand what is happening in Tigray and what might be done to address the situation are our panellists and I'll introduce them now. First of all, I'm really delighted to have with us Maesa Gabramadin, who is an international relations specialist, human rights advocate and community organiser with Omna Tigray, a non-partisan global organisation that advocates for Tigrayans and other marginalised people. She is also the co-founder of the first independent women's rights movement in Tigray, Ethiopia. Before the start of the ongoing war, Maiza, along with her colleagues at the Independent Women's Rights Movement, was successful in providing humanitarian and economic assistance to vulnerable women who were highly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Along with Maiza, I also have Viseha Tekle, who is Amnesty International's researcher on the Horn of Africa, based in Amnesty's East Africa, Great Lakes and Horn of Africa Regional Office. Viseha has led Amnesty's research and advocacy work in Ethiopia. He's a human rights lawyer with a special focus on transitional justice, accountability and victim remedy. Before joining Amnesty International in 2015, Faseha worked with local and international organisations in Ethiopia as a human rights consultant and as leader of a local civil society organisation. Last but not least, I'm pleased to welcome Awet Welder Michael, Professor and Queen's National Scholar in African History at Queen's University in Canada. Awet, studied at UCLA. Go Bruins! Awet holds a PhD in history and an LLM in public international law. He's an expert on the Horn of Africa and has been studying the ongoing security and political dynamics in the countries of the region. His most recent book is Piracy in Somalia, Violence and Development in the Horn of Africa, which was published in 2019 by Cambridge University Press. So welcome all three of you. Thank you so much for making time. And I'd like to start Maaza by turning to you and asking us, asking you to outline for us what's happening right now on the ground in Tigray. Thank you very much, Kate, and hello everybody, fellow panelists and everyone in attendance. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you very much to the Institute for facilitating this platform um, and to bring the plight of the Tigray people to your audience's attention. Having said that, my name is Maiza Gide and I'm from Tigray. Um, I am one among the many Tigrans in the diaspora that are worried about the well-being of their family members. Um, after working for over two years or laying the ground for about two years, the Ethiopian government alongside its cronies in Eritrea as well as within Ethiopia have launched, uh, launched a genocidal war against the people of Tigray uh, last year on November 4th. Since the launch of uh, the war, uh, Tigrans have been faced with mounting war crimes and crimes against humanity. Um, that includes weaponized sexual-based, gender-based violence, as well as a man-made famine. Uh, because of uh, the, the ongoing war, over, over 200,000 civilians have been massacred. They have been massacred in their homes, in their place of worship, including church and mosques. They have been massacred um, everywhere, including in the streets of Tigray. Um, all health facilities in Tigray have been destroyed or are looted by the invading forces that came from Eritrea as well as from Ethiopia. And Tigrans uh, that are not within Tigray or that are residing in different parts of Ethiopia are also exposed to arbitrary mass arrest and they're taken to different concentration camps. 
So what's happening to the people of Tigray, both to those who are in Tigray as well as everywhere else in, in, in Ethiopia is quite appalling. It's very sad because, uh, as I said, the genocide that war is about to mark one year anniversary on November 4th of uh, next month. However, there hasn't been any significant move taken by the international community and emboldened by this lack of international by this lack of action from the internal uh, international community uh, the Ethiopian government continues to uh, launch airstrikes that claim the lives of innocent lives particularly those in the capital city of Maala uh, as we speak today there has been two massive airstrikes that targeted innocent civilians including a pregnant mother and even two days ago there has been similar incidents so what's happening is an active state-sponsored genocide against the people of Tigray. And I, I hope uh, I will have a chance to get into details of the war, why it started and what can be done in order to stop it. Thank you. Liza, thank you very much for that very disturbing outline. I mean, you've mentioned a genocidal campaign twice. You also talked about concentration camps. For Seha, I wonder if we could turn to you and ask uh, what uh, you know, maybe you want to comment on those two those two qualifications, but also just tell us what has Amnesty been seeing and reporting on since uh, the conflict began in November 2020. Mm, uh, thank you, Kate, and also thanks, Maza, for the succinct summary of some of the major. Uh, development since the war uh, started. Uh, well, uh, we have to be clear that uh, this uh, conflict, uh, since the beginning, since uh, day one, uh, it was being conducted under uh, information blackouts. Uh, so there was a, a serious uh, information blackout since the conflict started especially mainly targeting Tigray, but that has kind of expanded after the war has spilled over to the neighboring areas or to areas in Amhara and Afar region which are affected by the conflict. Uh, there is also uh, what we call uh, misinformation, disinformation campaigns uh, from both sides uh, and uh, access to media uh, uh, and journalists, especially to the war affected areas, mainly Tigray, uh, was uh, seriously curtailed uh, even now. So in the absence of all uh, uh, these uh, restrictions and information blackout, uh, uh, collecting evidence and verifying information, especially mainly on human rights violations has been very challenging, uh, not only for other international, but uh, similar other human rights organizations, conflict uh, focused organizations, or even uh, the international media. So in this context, uh, what Amnesty International was able to document uh, and publish about the human rights violations uh, almost in the last one year uh, cannot be conclusive or it cannot be uh, presented as the whole picture of all the human rights uh, uh, violations that took place in Tigray. What we were able to publish about uh, or publicly comment about where uh, maybe we can see that just the tip of the iceberg. So the totality of uh, human rights violations that took place, not only in Tigray, even after the, the conflict has spilled over to Amhara and uh, Afar, uh, are yet to be uh, fully uh, documented and published. So in this uh, uh, situation, what we, we have witnessed, I mean, serious uh, uh, human rights violations, despite all these limitations within this challenge, we have documented serious uh, human rights violations, including uh, mass uh, extrajudicial uh, executions. Uh, we also uh, documented uh, indiscriminate attacks on civilian uh, uh, on civilians and civilian neighborhoods or civilian institutions, including refugee camps by both parties to the conflict or uh, associated forces uh, uh, to the main parties to the conflict. 
So by I mean uh, Allied, when I say Allied forces, the, the, the Eritrean Defense Force and the Amara Special Force and Farno militia are the ones which I'm referring to. That is in addition to the Ethiopian National Defense Force and also uh, forces uh, that are under the uh, umbrella of the TPLF that has now uh, recently changed to be uh, TDF. Uh, <clears throat> So, uh, in addition, maybe you might remember that Amnesty International has documented widespread use of sexual violence. I mean, uh, we don't have to kind of balance between different human rights violations, but maybe one of the serious human rights violations we have documented in this conflict is use of uh, rape by forces and life to the uh, the federal government, including the Eritrean Defense Force, uh, the FANO, the Special Force from Amara region, and the European National Defense Force uh, members. Uh, so you might remember that we spoke to about 63 uh, uh, victims of sexual violence, and among these, 28 of them said that they were uh, raped by Eritrean uh, Defense Forces. And, and this sexual violence started from day one, or uh, pretty much from the early days of the conflict, and that has continued until mid-June, until the time we were able to document, uh, uh, document them in June, uh, before the complete shutdown of internet communication, mobile communication, uh, in Tigray, following the withdrawal of the Ethiopian forces from Tigray. Uh, so, I mean, uh, the human rights violations are very grave, uh, serious, uh, and we can say that uh, uh, they can amount to crimes against humanity, uh, uh, and some of them they might even amount to war crimes. Uh, so, both uh, that are uh, both are crimes under international law, uh, punishable under international law. Uh, in, uh, so uh, the human rights situation is grave uh, uh, and serious in this conflict, and uh, maybe I can come back to the uh, accountability mechanisms which are uh, already there and also the investigations are already there, but uh, let me stop here now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Faseha. Um, I wonder if I could bring you in to give us um, a little of the context. So we've jumped right into what's happening on the ground and, and what the experience of people in, in Tigra is at the moment. Um, Faseya has referred to both sides and he mentioned the TPLF. I mean, for our audience who are not so familiar with the situation in Ethiopia generally and the conflict in Tigray, I wonder if you could just, in very simple terms, lay out to us uh, what's going on you know, politically and perhaps give us uh, some historical background to that. Thank you, Kay, um, for making this possible. Uh, good to see you again, uh, Fisa. And uh, I'm very delighted to have Maaza on board. Um, and uh, I'd like to applaud the Tigrayan digital activists who made this possible. And I'm grateful to you also, Kate, for making that happen because no matter um, how good intentioned external expertise and uh, solidarity, cannot match the voice of um, the affected populations. And um, excuse me, I, I, I must forgive, uh, you, you must forgive me because I'm at the airport and I'm just being interrupted. Sorry about that. Um, and I want to assure Tigrayans out there in the virtual world, um, I never claim to be their representative or be speaking in their name. Um, I'm an academic, I'm an expert of this region. Um, my personal values, experiences, and profession compel me to side with victims. And what voice I have, I've been using it and I'll continue to use it to amplify the voice of the victims, not to replace them. Having said that, let me complicate or show the gravity of the situation before I give the historical or political context. First of all, 
the Horn of Africa, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Somalia, is one of the poorest parts of the African continent. Coming to Tigray, before the war started, more than a million Tigrayans depended on food aid, lived off food aid. Um, the vast majority of the rest act a very difficult living from um, rain-based subsistence agriculture exposed to the vagaries of climate change and difficult environments. And just before the war broke out, the region as the rest of the Horn of Africa was invaded by a massive infestation of locusts. And when the war started, Tigrayans suffered heavily because their territory was not only where the fighting took place, but also deliberate targeting of civilians and civilian infrastructure was part of the war strategy of the war insides. And so granaries, whether individual, private business or collective, were either looted or burned down. Harvests were destroyed or set on fire. Agricultural implements, including animals, um, were either killed, destroyed, or uh, looted. Um, and, and the rest of civilian infrastructure, the limited development that was uh, made possible in the previous decades were systematically destroyed. And this is, don't take my word for it, the second highest Ethiopian army general, General Abebe, listed the accomplishments of the campaign as, and these are some of them. Okay, so this happened until June. When at the end of June, the Ethiopian military was militarily forced out of Tigray and the Eritrean military through a combination of diplomatic pressure and its own strategic self-interest and calculations decided to pull out of the large swaths of Tigray. All the warring sides, the allies, the federal Ethiopian government, the Eritrean government, and the Amhara militia effectively blockaded the region of Tigray. This probably constitutes one of the largest military sieges in modern military warfare. So you have this cascading problems. And so when we talk about famine today, it's coming in the heel of all these steps. And in the interest of your audiences, who I expect would be students, uh, in the interest of your audience, who I expect to be students, especially undergraduate students, let me elaborate what I'm talking about when I say famine. Typically in the human uh, uh, humanities and social sciences, we say that drought is a natural phenomenon, but famine is a man-made situation. But when, in that context, when we say famine is a man-made situation following drought, we're talking about, in typical situations, policy failures. Policy failures to mitigate the effects of droughts. But what we see in Tigray today is deliberate policy of Im imposing famine on the civilian population of Tigray. And this is the context that we are faced. So the gravity, actually, I don't think uh, uh, Ma'aza and Fisaha have given the bleak, bleak their, their, their view was, their, their presentation was not bleak enough. Neither is mine to be completely honest because the situation is really, really grave. A stain on our conscience as humanity is the, the lightest way of explaining it. How did we get here is probably the question that you asked me and please stop me if I'm talking too much. It's, it's a long complex story, but where it starts is it has a, a long-term, intermediate, and immediate. The, the, the long-term, I don't want to sound very academic, but in the 30 years, that the, 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 the 27 years that the EPRDF, the coalition that ruled Ethiopia, that was dominated by the TPLF, um, it made tremendous progress in terms of economic advancement in the country, in terms of social development, in terms of services and educational and other institutions, tremendous development. But politically, it remained repressive. 
Okay? That is one domestic component. Externally, it was engaged in a very devastating war with, with Eritrea, which remains unresolved, which the Eritrean dictator has used as a justification to plunge back into this war and get his pound of flesh from his former nemesis, the, the TPLF in Tigray. Okay. Now let's go back to domestic Ethiopian matters where the economic and socio cultural and other developments were not matched by political uh, liberalization, so to speak. The very partners, TPLF is very partners in the EPRDF coalition are now the core of the current prosperity party government in Ethiopia. But they assigned the entire blame for what happened in the preceding 27 years to the TPLF and they're going after the TPLF, basically. The mechanics of it follow different routes. The, the prime minister who came in the wake of popular uprising following the, the sudden resignation of Haile Mariam de Sali, um, decided to delay elections because of COVID-19. At least that's the official explanation. The TPLF government which is the government in Northern Ethiopia in the Tigray region, decided to go ahead with the election. This is one of the many factors. And tit for tat went on both before and after the elections until the, the Eritrean Amhara militia and um, uh, federal Ethiopian troops started to amass and get ready for the attack, which was preempted by TPLF's nightly attack on the Northern Command on the night of November 3, morning of November 4. That left the Ethiopian Prime Minister and Eritrean President with either of two options, to strike back just as they had been planning to do because we've been watching their military mobilization and they were on the ready. And there is plenty of public evidence of their readiness. The other option is to sit back, rethink, and do something. The two decided to strike. And we are here as a result of that cascade of problems with all the parties playing distractive role. And the ultimate sacrifice right now is being paid by the innocent civilian population of Tigray, with whom I stand in solidarity. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you for that really magisterial um an extremely clear laying out of the current situation, which is of course a very complex one and rooted in the specifics of, uh, of the region, which our audience may not be familiar with, but I think we'll have some grasp of now. But as I wanted to turn to you just to see if you have any comment on Awet's characterization of the situation, or if that is also how you see events. Um, I, I, I don't have that much, um, I don't have that much of a big point to make against what a professor out laid out i i actually think he did a very, quite a good job but the two things i need to, cl to clarify is first of all there is this tendency to frame the ongoing genocidal war as if it's a war that is being fought against the tibet life it is not this is a war against the people of tigray it's a war against our identity and against our collective existence and we say this not because we're from tigray but we say this because there are mounting evidences showing that tigrans everywhere across ethiopia are being targeted and tigrans ac across ethiopia are being targeted not just since november 1st but from the very beginning abi ahmed came to power he came to power because the Iperidev understood and realized that there were a need for political reform in the country. And they took very admirable steps that including freeing of um, previously arrested political prisoners and, and, and others. They tried to widen the political scope of, of the country. However, once Abi came to power, he took credit for all these reformative actions that the, EPR, the Zen Iperidev decided to, to undertake. And he started forming a military pact with the Eritrean dictator Isaias Aforiki. However, to so many Tigrans and I believe Ethiopians' dismay, the international community was made to believe that this was a genuine effort 
between Eritrea and Ethiopia to form peace. However, that's not what happened. What happened is the people of Tigray, who are on the borderline with Eritrea, were sidelined and both dictators used the agreement, between, the agreement they made, which actually ended up getting a Nobel Peace Prize for Abiy Ahmed. They used this as a military pact to design and orchestrate the, the genocide that you see today. Uh, and, and so that's why it's very important to understand that this from the very beginning has been, it's, it's a deliberate state sponsored genocide that's been carried out against the people of Tigray. And the other thing is, um, uh, I, I, I believe um, Professor, um, uh, I, it wasn't Professor Awad, I think it was Mr. Fisaha who said that now the Tepelif has turned into Tidev. That's not the case. Tepelif still remains to be the political party that was resoundingly elected by the people of Tigray on the, on the election they had by defying the undemocratic call made by Abiy Ahmed to postpone the election. So Tepelif is still the democratically elected uh, government of Tigray, while Tidev remains to be uh, the military force that is trying to, to, to defend the people of Tigray against this aggression that is being made both by the Ethiopian and Eritrean invading forces. Uh, these are the only two remarks I wanted to make, but I do agree that the, grim, the gravity of the man-made famine is beyond what words can explain. This is so much worse than the famine we have seen in Somalia, and we know how terrible the famine in Somalia was. Thank you. Wow, that's really, yeah, that puts it in, in context. Thank you very much, Maza. I want to talk specifically about the blockade and the famine a little and, and what, what you think might be some potential avenues to address that. But before I do, I just want to ask Pisea and Awet whether you have any comments on, you know, Maza has twice now referred to genocide. She now talked about there being evidence that Tigrayan people are being targeted on the basis of ethnicity, even outside the region. I mean, do either of you have a comment? Have you... What, how, how do you react to that accusation? Thank you. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe it's uh, the same thing what I've said at the beginning of my uh, discussion. Uh, this war is being fought in, in, in information blackouts, uh, given that uh, what we were able to establish as human rights violation uh, since the beginning of the conflict and up to now uh, is not sufficient to provide a comprehensive view of all the human rights situations here. So <clears throat> based on what we have documented and we are able to verify, uh, we are saying that they might amount crimes against humanity, which is different from uh, uh, genocide. Uh, 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 or war crime, they might amount to war crime. Uh, so, I mean, this determination requires further investigation, at least based on uh, what we have. Uh, and so the international uh, law on genocide, uh, it has a very strict uh, 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 evidence threshold to determine genocide. But, so I don't want to go to the legal details on that, but uh, it's it's worth uh, uh, in more uh, investigating. Uh, it is uh, 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 the whole extent of human rights violations in this context are going to are yet to come out. Uh, so uh, maybe by then we might say genocide or not. Uh, but at this level, uh, we are not committed. We are, we are not saying we are not using that term because we have limited information on that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I want to turn to uh, what the current options are for intervention or potentially conflict resolution, but maybe first of all intervention and particularly in relation to the blockade and the famine. And I'm also responding to a question we've received in the Q&A from a member of the audience um, who talks about who says 5.2 million Tigrayans are being made to starve by the federal government of Ethiopia in a use of hunger as a weapon of war not seen since the Holocaust. The federal government of Ethiopia, even by their own admission, are blocking aid from reaching civilians. The UN has been on standby for a year now, and I saw just this morning a report that the UN are halving their operations in the country. And of course, as I said at the outset, Martin Griffiths has referred to this blockade. So the question is, what can the international community do to force 
the federal government of Ethiopia to allow access to Tigray, but maybe more generally. Um, and I might start, oh, I was going to start with Awet, but I think we've lost him. Um, what, you know, how might uh, that this situation of the blockade and the humanitarian crisis be addressed by the international community? Um, Maiza, would you like to start on that one? Yeah, sure. Um, before before I answer that question, I just want to make one point clear. Um, in this panel discussion, and probably um, on our digital advocacy, you might have seen a lot of Tigrans and the lives of the Tigray people referring to what's happening as a state-sponsored genocide. And, and the main reason why we do that is because uh, although the legality could be determined by uh, relevant international actors, but genocide in, in, in a nutshell is it's the deliberate killing or, dis or annihilation of a group of people. And what you see in Tigray is nothing short of that. And, and this is, there are mounting event, evidence that can prove this. And one of them is, as it was documented by the same name, the rape survivors that somehow made it out of the war zone and are currently in the refugee camps in Sudan alongside other uh, around 70,000 refugees have attested that as the Amhara militias and members of the Ethiopian army, as they were raping them, they were they told them that they were doing it in order to cleanse their bloodline, in order to make sure that the Tigrayan womb doesn't continue to reproduce. So this clearly shows you that the intent of this invading forces in this war is clear. All they want is to annihilate or exterminate the people of Tigray, either in part or in whole. And the Ethiopian federal government has done so little to hide its genocidal intentions of this war. Uh, as it was... Um, discussed by the European Union's um, uh, uh, delegate to, to Ethiopia, His Excellency um, Mr. Hafizo, to, he, who happens to be the Foreign Minister of Finland, he briefed the, the, the European Parliament in one of the meetings they had that Ethiopian officials had told him that they wanted to exterminate or destroy the people of Tigray for another hundred years to come. So this clearly shows the genocidal intent of the Ethiopian government and its allies in waging this genocidal war against the people of Tigray. So as we continue to plea and to push the international community, particularly the US government and other actors to, to conduct a thorough investigation and, de and determine what's happening as a genocide, we also want to, we, we want internet members of the international community, which are not necessarily in place of power, which are not necessarily politicians, to really to, to look at the evidences, to believe the victims and the survivors of this genocidal war and, and believe them what's happening is a genocide. So yes, legality and, and all might delay the process. However, the victims very well know that what's happening is being onto the, being done onto them in order to annihilate and, and destroy them. So that's why we say genocide, we understand Genocide is such a heavy term. We understand it's not a word to play around with. We know what people who went through a genocide survived from. So when we say genocide, believe us, we're saying it because that is exactly what our people are going through. Um, having said that, what can the international community do in order to, to avert or to, to stop the ongoing suffering of the people of Tigray? I believe the question you asked me. And the answer is very simple. Perpetrators of this crime have to be held accountable. Those who continue to commit war crimes and crimes against humanity upon the people of Tigray, they need to face justice. But for all of, for all of that to happen, the people of Tigray deserve break. They deserve peace and stability. And this can only be done if, first of all, there is cessation of hostilities. And the cessation of hostilities should come immediately. It shouldn't take years or months for international actors to force the Ethiopian government to stop its hostilities against the people of Tigray and their government. Um, the people of Tigray, starting the, before the beginning of the war, all the way until recently, have been expressing their readiness and willingness to, to find political solution or to find political settlement to this crisis. It's only the Ethiopian government that is yet to declare its willingness and, and readiness for peace, for peace talks. And we believe this is mainly because the international community, despite the mounting evidence they have, continue to babysit the dictator in Ethiopia and as well as in Eritrea. I'll give you an example. Just today and two days ago, there was an airstrike in Magala, the capital city of Tigray, and it claimed the lives of so many innocent lives in Tigray. 
we got an information that members of the UN, human right, humanitarian workers, had fled, they left Magala hours prior to their strike. And what does this tell you? Why did they leave Magala? And only within hours, the Ethiopian government deployed its war jets and destroyed the city. So we feel like the international community is giving the green light to the Ethiopian government to go ahead and continue to destroy the people of Tigray in the darkness. So the international community really needs to do more than sending this uh, lip service condemnation and, and talks. We need the international community to, to, to uphold its responsibility to protect and, and to take concerted punitive measures against the Ethiopian government as well as its allies. And for example, the, the, the American president, His Excellency Joe Biden, had issued a presidential uh, order that gives the necessary mandate to different uh, organizations within the US government to impose sanctions on Ethiopia, Eritrea, and other um, warring parties. However, these talks of sanction are yet to materialize. And as the international community continues to give more chances to the genocidal forces, the people of Tigray are suffering in between. So we need immediate action. And this action should focus on, first of all, immediate cessation of hostilities. And following that, the international community should work towards facilitating an inclusive national dialogue and peace talks between the warring parties. And in addition to that, there also needs to be unfettered and unrestricted humanitarian access to Tigray. Because the people of Tigray, as I said previously, are not dying only of the warplanes and the jets and the artillery. They're also dying of a man-made famine. As it was reported by the Associated Press, a mom had to kill herself because she couldn't stand seeing her, her children die because of hunger. So she literally took her own life and she committed suicide. And, and mind you, this is only a story of one mom. You can only imagine what the remaining 6 million and, and more than that civilians in Tigray are going through. So people are dying of starvation. They're also dying of otherwise pre preventable or, or curable diseases because all the health facility have been either destroyed or looted by the invading forces. And the doctors are just sitting there counting the numbers of diseases. They won't save the people, but they don't have the necessary equipment to do so. So all of these things can be averted. It can be stopped if the international community has the necessary political will to bring the Ethiopian government as well as its allies to justice. And this can only be done through punitive measures. Diplomacy has failed so far. So but I, I, I think these are some of the things that can be done, but um, global citizens such as the attendees, the students here that are listening to this discussion, they can help us make this possible by actively participating in our campaigns, by actively engaging with their local representatives and politicians. Because I don't believe a genocide is something that needs to be fought only by those at the receiving end of it, but also by everybody that opposes injustice and, 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 and destruction of innocent lives. Thank you so much, Maza, for that really um, extremely articulate expression of what's going on and I think it very sobering and we had a comment from Owet that nobody was really portraying how bleak the situation was but I think we're starting to get there with your expression there and um, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that we're able to have this webinar and that you're able to speak to the people who are dialing in and I see we have 142 participants so um, I hope that that goes some way to raising awareness about what's going on and that action can be taken. I wonder if you could comment on the path forward and the likelihood for the kind of punitive action that Maaza was calling for taking place and, and how you see um, from the international community the potential for intervention and resolution of this in an absolutely urgent situation. Um, first of all, at the moment, not only um, are Tigrayans starving by design, but the war has also expanded in scope and has become even more intractable. And geographically, it has overflown now to the Af neighboring Afar region and neighboring Amhara region, where um, federal government and, and their allied uh, militia seem to crumble 
almost on the innocent contact with TDF. And I agree TDF is no longer TPLF. TDF is far more diverse. And although the TPLF has the political power, those who are fighting are known members, known non-TPLF, and some actively opposed to the TPLF. So it would be it would only be right to call the fighting forces as TDF. So when when the war expands in scope, the the atrocities, the 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 grave situation that we've been discussing in Tigray is likely to also happen in these other regions. So what I'm saying is that without, while, while the, the, the dire situation in Tigray is getting worse, other regions are also catching up. And this is likely to grow and deepen unless immediately stopped. And the, the, the party in the international community with the authority and power to do so is the United Nations Security Council, which has met at least 10 times by my count to discuss Tigray under different guises, but up to now has not come with a single resolution in either direction. So why? I don't know. I hope to understand. The Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, Antonio Guterres, um, I have been consistently critical of him for not using the power of his office to come more heavily on the warring sides to, 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 to come to the, to the table. Um, I was happy to see him being more forceful in the last UN Security Council meeting when they were discussing the expulsion of the seven UN humanitarian officials. We got to appoint even the more optimistic Martin Griffith has come out saying, this is a stain on humanity's conscience and we need to do something. Um, but who is to do that something if the international community is sitting on their hands? So the, I applaud President Biden for the executive order, but this is not something that can stop through sanctions. And sanctions take time to have effect on the ground. Regimes such as the ones fighting the war in, in, in Northern Ethiopia have developed mechanisms of, of, of busting sanctions or surviving sanctions. So what we need at this point, from my point of view, is an international protection force to protect civilians in all affected areas and guarantees delivery of humanitarian assistance, which are badly needed to save the, 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 those who are affected and still hanging to life. Um, the, the humanitarian situation is such as um, the, Mr. Beasley, the WFP um, uh, World Food Program Director, uh, Director General, said estimates that on a daily basis, we need 140 or so trucks loaded with humanitarian assistance of various types on a daily basis, 140 or something like that. Between June, end of June, and now, less than 500 such trucks have found their way to Tigray, okay? I don't care who is to blame about this. What I want your audience to know is that, count the numbers of days between end of June to now, end of June being the time that Federal troops were pushed out of the ground. They did not withdraw, they were pushed out. And the siege was placed to today. I don't have my calendar in front of me. So count those days and multiply them by 140 trucks. And deduct from that 500 or so, or 600 even, let me be generous. All that gap is that was needed in order to save the lives that have already perished and those who are hanging onto dear life. So right now what we need is immediate cessation of hostilities and immediate humanitarian access so that such an intervention could be mounted to scale. We will have a long time and long debates to discuss the subsequent steps that need to be taken. 
But right now, I would like to see the international community. I'm happy the US government has its sights clear on this issue and the European Union as well. It's about time that this clarity is turned into action to save lives and end this carnage. Because even in the battlefield, this literally is carnage. And you cannot see a peaceful region. And I'm not, I'm no longer talking about Ethiopia at this point. Because Ethiopia collapsing is a tsunami going in all directions across the Horn of Africa, if not the continent. And after so much carnage, there won't be much hope for peace unless immediate interve intervention puts an end to the ongoing carnage and saves lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to turn to the one issue that you highlighted, Maaza, in your remarks. Um, so along with the, you know, we, you, you raised the issue of an international protection force, aware, and of course, both of you talked about immediate cessation of hostilities and obviously the end of the blockade. But Maaza, you also talked about accountability. And I wanted to turn to Viseha and ask you to talk about any efforts for accountability that are currently underway and how you think they might develop and what might be the options for accountability for what's happening in the region? Mm, uh, thank you. I mean, mm, uh, uh, for situations like that, accountability is key. Uh, it is uh, deterrent, uh, it is educative, and uh, it's also it also has an intrinsic value. It's justice. I mean, justice has an intrinsic value by itself. Uh, so, I mean, given the grave uh, uh, human rights violations that can amount to crimes against humanity and war crime in this conflict, uh, uh, accountability is the main issue and the main concern which we want to uh, promote and ensure. Uh, it's also key for uh, any uh, peaceful resolution of uh, this conflict. Uh, while some people uh, are tempted to kind of uh, divest uh, accountability from uh, uh, peaceful resolution, uh, I can say that these two accountability and uh, uh, conflict resolution uh, uh, and peace uh, are intrinsically linked. So uh, when we look at, I mean, in general, there are uh, two or three types of accountability mechanisms. One is domestic, uh, the other one is, uh, I mean, what they call hybrid, uh, uh, which is a very, uh, very wide option, uh, and international accountability. But before that, what do we need? We need proper investigation of the human rights violations that happened in this complex. So there are so many hurdles for that. Uh, uh, lack of access, lack of information, security challenge, all those things, and also lack of mechanisms. I mean, we have not seen any uh, concrete measures in terms of uh, uh, investigating that and documenting and preserving evidence uh, uh, of human rights violations in this conflict. It's not only investigation, but also there has to be preservation of evidence because uh, the way I see it, I don't think that there is going to be uh, a short term uh, uh, accountability. And in this context, preservation of evidence is uh, very key. So these are not happening. There is no internationally, at least uh, UN mandated commission of inquiry uh, or any other mechanism. Uh, there is uh, one commendable uh, initiative by the African uh, human rights, uh, the High hum uh, Peoples and Human Rights Commission, by the, the Commission of Inquiry, which was uh, mandated last May, uh, if I'm not mistaken, maybe April, 
uh, that was uh, a very good initiative, but uh, the Ethiopian government has not even uh, acknowledged it. It rather uh, rejected it. And the government is highly promoting the joint investigation between the Office of High Commissioner and the National Human Rights Commission. Uh, so uh, a, a human rights violation of this magnitude uh, needs its own investigation mechanism. Uh, so that is uh, really missing. Uh, so uh, the first step is investigation and preservation. That's not happening. Uh, so after investigation, assuming that there is going to be investigation and uh, collection of evidence, what, is the, uh, what are the different options? As I have said, domestic. Uh, but I have a lot of doubt on domestic accountability mechanisms in Ethiopia. Uh, chances of having fair trial which is also human rights, are uh, extremely low, uh, given the reputation of the Ethiopian uh, judicial system. It's not only now, but it also it has been accumulating for years. Uh, and also risks of uh, short trials uh, that mainly focus on low-ranking officials uh, are also a possibility, and lack of political commitment uh, to go after uh, officials in the higher uh, uh, political and military positions uh, might be lacking in the domestic uh, accountability mechanisms. So that there are other alternatives. So, I mean, what they call hybrid courts. So hybrid, I mean, uh, it has a, a kind of a lot of uh, uh, mixes, laws, mechanisms and uh, procedures and uh, so hybrid is a very uh, wide term uh, uh, to, to apply. Uh, well, I mean, the international experience in terms of hybrid courts has not been very uh, uh, fully uh, confident in inspiring courts. I mean, uh, uh, maybe some cases, it's really the, uh, in some cases, only in some cases, but not all hybrid courts work very well uh, internationally from the experience. Uh, I don't want to go to the details, but the record is not very uh, uh, good. The other option is that international criminal courts and it is not party to the wrong statutes. So uh, only referral by the UN Security Council can take the matter to, uh, uh, to the UN Security Council. And uh, as Professor Raoult has already uh, uh, described, uh, is there any appetite to put it up at that kind of uh, 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 limelight, uh, especially in the UN Security Council? Uh, that's one question. And also there is some kind of fatigue about referral to the ICC given the experience in uh, Sudan and other countries, and also the resistance from African countries. So. Uh, uh, in general, uh, the accountability mechanisms are not uh, really uh, uh, um, there, um, at, at, at least from the from uh, our current standpoint. Uh, but uh, uh, that's, I mean, like, we don't have to worry about the accountability mechanisms for me. What is more important is about investigating and collecting evidence. So the accountability mechanism comes late last. Thank you very much, Pasea, and I feel like you've opened a whole another webinar worth of questions for us to dive into, um, but we just have a few minutes left. So I think in those few minutes, I'll maybe turn back to Maaza and just, I wanted to also refer, you mentioned briefly the joint investigation, which is going on, of course, by the UN High Commissioner, the Human Rights Office, along with the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission, which was due to deliver its report on the 1st of November. Um, I'm not sure if that's still on schedule with the expulsion of the UN officials just recently, but um, Maza, maybe I'll turn to you just to talk about your, um, your hopes and fears for that report and then any closing remarks that you'd like to make uh, today. Um, yeah, it's still on the schedule and it seems like uh, the European Union particularly is waiting for the findings of that report to either move towards with sanctions or, or not to. And as a member of the Tigran community, again, a community that is being exterminated, not only by, by one state, but by two states and so many other local actors, uh, we do not trust the findings. We do not trust any investigation that is going to include 
and Ethiopian Authority. The Ethiopian Human Rights Commission is a state sponsor, it's, it's a state uh, appointed uh, organization. Uh, the leader of that particular organization has been known to gaslight or to water down the impacts of the ongoing genocide. Um, and we believe him as an individual, the, the director of the Human Rights Commission, as well as the human rights by itself has a vested political interest in uh, sustaining the genocide, but also in protecting those committing the war crimes, uh, mainly the Ethiopian government. And, and for this and so many other reasons, we do not believe that whatever finding is going to be presented or published on November 1st is going to reflect the truth. Um, and another very technical uh, reason is, apart from the political, the technical reason why we do not accept these findings is that the, find, the investigation was not conducted in major parts of Tigray, in parts where there was massive uh, massacre of innocent civilians, where there was massive raping of innocent women and destruction of property. So uh, not only does the report um, has a very reductive perspective or looking to what happened, but we also do not really uh, feel safe in presenting witnesses to any Ethiopian authority. So we don't have any hope whatsoever. And my fear is that the international com community continues to find um, a scapegoating mechanism to save the Ethiopian government. I don't believe the international community is yet ready to let go of the dictator regime in Ethiopia. And in order to hide these tendencies, they continue to come up with projects and initiatives that we very well know do not have the, the best interest of the victims at heart. Endorsing a joint investigation, an investigation that would include an Ethiopian appointed authority from the very beginning tells you that the international community just wants to find a way out of this and not to be accountable, not to take meaningful actions to really help the victim. So it's, it's my fear that this finding would only cement all the media propaganda the Ethiopian government has been spreading around. It will either reduce the magnitude of the crimes or it will escape God and blame others, blame people who do not really commit the crimes. And, and in all of this, you will have victims that would not get justice for all the pain that they were forced to, to, to incur. And, my other pain and my other fear is that as we continue to call upon the international community to do what is right and safe, we would, we would run out of time. We will run out of time and civilians will die, not only in hundreds, but also in millions. Because as we speak, 6.8 million Tigrans are in need of emergency humanitarian aid. And the Ethiopian government, as Professor Awad uh, clearly articulated it earlier, declared a humanitarian siege on the people of Tigray for 121 days yet, and it's ongoing. It has been 121 days since humanitarian aid trucks, trucks carrying food and life-saving medicine were allowed into Tigray. Whenever the pressure would increase, the Ethiopian government would let one or two trucks to be deployed to Tigray. And after that, the international community would forget that people are indeed dying of starvation and would go as if business as usual. So the, the Ethiopian government has been emboldened by the reluctance and lack of political commitment from the international community. And at, in the midst of this, civilians are dying daily of starvation. And by the time we realized that it was its right to hold the Ethiopian government accountable and its allies and to intervene, it would be too late. It would be too little too late and we'll have another yet never again. The international community will come back and say, we should have done this, we should have done that. And they will say, we'll never do this. They will, it will be a complete never again, but people like myself, the Tigrans, would be deprived of their childhood, they will be deprived of their family members. And an entire ethnic group will be annihilated from this earth and it will be too little too late. That's my fear. Thank you very much, Miza, for leaving us with that, um, that terrifying thought and also, I hope, a, a call to action. So I'd like to thank all of the panellists very much for making your time and expertise available for us today. Thank you very much to the audience for joining us. Uh, we've mentioned uh, Omna Tigre, the organisation that Miaza is working with. You know, of course, Amnesty International, 
which Viseha is doing important research there and um, Awet, uh, I'm sure, is also making his views and analysis of the situation public for people that want to continue following this. Thank you all very much for joining us today and uh, goodbye. <laughs>